When Japan debuted its Shinkansen bullet train in 1964, it took the world by storm. Up to this point, the idea of a purpose-built high-speed rail system was purely conceptual. Now after years of planning and development, this futuristic dream had finally become a reality. No other country was even close to building a system of this caliber. Even the United States, which had enjoyed immense economic prosperity after World War II, had left its rail infrastructure to rot. Commercial airlines and national highways were the new popular ways to travel, and the passenger rail industry was on the brink of complete collapse. Japan's new achievement was a kick in the pants to US politicians, who suddenly realized that America might not be number one at something. A year later, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed into law the High Speed Ground Transportation Act. This would kick off a decades-long journey to research and develop high-speed rail projects across the United States. But in the broader sense, this bill was designed for new concepts in rail travel as a whole, ones that could move people more efficiently and reduce the number of cars on the road. One of the first ideas to be studied was actually European in origin. Specialized long-distance trains, like the UK's motor rail, allowed people to bring their personal vehicles with them to their destination. This saved the hassle of driving hundreds of miles, and gave passengers a chance to relax, catch some sleep, or eat a hot meal. The idea had been kicked around in the US before, but on the whole, this would be a new concept to the American public. And in just a few years, it would become one of the most successful transportation projects in the nation. From 1966 to 67, the US government put substantial research into the car train concept. In this earliest vision, passengers would ride in their vehicles inside specially designed rail cars. There would be onboard common spaces to walk around, relax, and eat a meal. But for the most part, folks would sit and sleep inside their own vehicles, as there would be no standard coach seating or sleeping compartments. The service was proposed to run between Washington, D.C. and Jacksonville, Florida, a distance of about 750 miles. It was estimated that 4 to 5 million people were driving between the Northeast and Florida each year. If the train could capture even a small piece of this market, it would be a financial success. But in 1967, the Department of Transportation faced some severe budget cuts, effectively pulling the rug out from under the project. In the House Committee's own words, if the project is economically feasible, there is no reason why private industry cannot proceed with it. In other words, the train was basically guaranteed to make money, so there was no need for the government to financially support it. All that was needed now was a private railroad company to pick up the project and run with it. The problem was, none of them were interested in taking it on. Passenger service only made up about 5% of the industry's total revenue while freight provided much more reliable business. Investing millions of dollars in an experimental passenger service was out of the question. The study gathered dust over the next couple of years, until it sparked new interest within the Department of Transportation itself. Eugene Garfield, a young lawyer and assistant to the Secretary of Transportation, found the study lying around in the office. He later recalled, It was just reading material. I was looking for something to read that night, so I took the study home. When I finished that report, my thoughts were, my god, why didn't someone do this before? 
Garfield soon resigned from his government position and founded a new company, the Autotrain Corporation, on April 11, 1969. It would ultimately take him two years to convince Wall Street investors to finance this risky new venture. But by 1971, the company raised $7 million from the sale of public stock. As other railroads cancelled more and more of their unprofitable passenger trains, Congress finally stepped in. They formed a new government corporation called Amtrak, which would keep America's passenger trains running through taxpayer funding. Most private railroads were happy to pass off this responsibility, and Amtrak was launched on May 1, 1971. Meanwhile, Gene Garfield was putting together the fleet for his auto train company. He ordered brand new locomotives from General Electric, and snatched up some of the best second-hand passenger cars on the market before Amtrak could get them. Among these were nearly all of the full-length dome cars from the Santa Fe Railway, and nearly all of the half-length dome cars from Union Pacific. He also purchased a fleet of auto carrier freight cars from Canadian National. Renovating all of this older equipment would be far more cost-effective than developing new rail cars from scratch. For the route itself, Autotrain would follow the original proposal very closely. The northern terminus would be in Lorton, Virginia, near Washington, D.C., while the southern terminus would be in Sanford, Florida, outside Orlando. Sanford was chosen rather than Jacksonville because this would bring travelers closer to the tourist hub of central Florida. This was also about a half hour's drive from a new destination that would open that same year, a little place called Walt Disney World. In addition to the standard platforms and check-in facilities, both terminals would have specially designed ramps for staff to load the vehicles on and off the train. One train would operate in each direction daily, departing in the evening, running through the night, and arriving the next morning. Aside from a couple brief stops for crew changes and refueling, the trains would run the 850 miles non-stop in about 15 hours. Auto Train's primary target audience would be the middle-aged and elderly crowd. Many retirees traveled from the northeast to Florida each winter to escape the cold weather, but this required them to drive upwards of a thousand miles in each direction. Auto Train posed a much more attractive option, as it would remove the stress and risks of a two-day road trip. And this was only the start of what would become the company's biggest selling point, an unforgettable passenger experience. While Auto Train would largely appeal to an older crowd, Gene Garfield wanted to create a hip and youthful atmosphere that could appeal to all ages. He was the company's oldest executive at just 35 years old, and most of the employees were in their 20s. Using this to their advantage, they set out to completely subvert the old stereotypes of grumpy conductors and dirty rail equipment. Auto Train's staff would be young, attractive, and eager to assist their passengers. The trains themselves would be exceptionally clean and decked out with modern interiors. To define the company's visual brand, Garfield sought the help of employee Carolyn Settles, a young designer from Washington, D.C. When given the task to pick a color scheme for the company, she chose a striking combination of bright red and purple. All of the rail equipment was soon painted in these garish colors, with a large amount of white to symbolize cleanliness. The staff uniforms were designed to match this color scheme as well. Settles herself said, You have to have something powerful for transportation. Purple and red are something you remember. We talked about the feeling we would like people to have on the train. Finally, we coined a phrase that we wanted the cars to be conservatively groovy. Passengers would enjoy two all-inclusive buffets on the trip, one for dinner in the evening and another for breakfast the next morning. Onboard movies would be screened each evening, and multiple nightclubs would offer cocktails and live entertainment. The whole idea was that your vacation didn't need to wait until you got to Florida. You could start having fun as soon as you stepped on board. To say the public was excited for Auto Train would be a severe understatement. Half a year before the train started running, thousands of people were already trying to contact the company to make reservations. The company eventually had to put out an advertisement, saying, To the thousands of people who've tried to call for reservations on the auto train to Florida and gotten a busy signal, please don't change your minds. 
honest, we really want your business. But the response has been beyond our wildest expectations. Auto Train's inaugural run departed from Lorton, Virginia on the evening of December 6, 1971, and arrived safely in Sanford, Florida the next morning. Daily service commenced in both directions, and over the following months, every train was booked solid well in advance. Within just 90 days of its launch, Auto Train was already turning a profit. Industry analysts were dumbfounded by what they were seeing. The public's interest in rail travel had been dwindling for years. Now Gene Garfield had created something so popular that it could barely keep up with the demand. While Auto Train was seeing immediate success, Amtrak was having a rough start. The government-run corporation was supposed to earn a profit, but many people were skeptical that this would ever happen. Amtrak had to somehow pick up the pieces of a broken industry, and create a cohesive level of service across a vast nationwide network. Earning a profit on top of this was an ambitious goal to say the least. From the very beginning, Amtrak's president Roger Lewis held a special resentment toward Autotrain. Railroads were not allowed to compete with Amtrak on the same routes, and there was an argument that Autotrain was competing with Amtrak's East Coast services, like the Champion and Silver Meteor. Technically, though, Auto Train was incorporated two years earlier than Amtrak. And Gene Garfield made the fair point that, We are a different type of service. We can't take passengers without cars or cars without passengers. We feel a different type of need. Clearly unconvinced, Amtrak launched a new program a few months later in April of 1972 called Free Wheels. Through this program, Passengers who traveled to Florida would be given a free rental car for a week upon their arrival. In this way, people didn't need to bring their own vehicles, and Amtrak didn't have to deal with the logistics of hauling them. It would also be easy to roll out this program to new cities across their network, without the need to build any special terminals. Roger Lewis told the press, This is not in retaliation to Autotrain. It's our way of keeping the driver off the road and giving him a chance to relax on the trip to Florida. Free wheels was a good idea on paper, but in practice, it was stupidly complicated for passengers. The promotion was only eligible with a minimum purchase of tickets from certain departure and arrival points. And once passengers arrived in Florida, they would have to find their own way from the train station to the rental car office, and then do it all again at the end of the trip. Also, Amtrak didn't offer any of the frills the Auto Train was famous for, yet Free Wheels somehow managed to be more expensive. Needless to say, Amtrak fundamentally misunderstood what made Auto Train so popular the fun and hassle free experience. The Miami Herald wrote Amtrak's only attempt to imitate Auto Train has missed the point. It offered some passengers free rental car service for a week, but there are still too many drawbacks to taking the regular train. In December of 1972, Auto Train celebrated its first anniversary. With the public demand as strong as ever, the company announced they would acquire another two trains to eventually double their capacity. The Orlando Sentinel later wrote, Only in the game of Monopoly can owning a railway system be considered a road to riches. Auto Train's success, after 15 months of operation, should be sufficient proof that the reported death of rail travel was not only highly exaggerated, but obscured tremendous potential. However, just two days later, the Auto Train Corporation would face its first major challenge. On the morning of March 13, 1973, a southbound auto train was traveling through Hortense, Georgia. A truck driver approached a rural road crossing that had no warning gates, and in the dense morning fog he couldn't see the train approaching at 70 miles per hour. In a fatal misjudgment, the driver collided with the train's second engine, causing a catastrophic derailment. The rail cars bunched up like an accordion, and passengers' vehicles were flung out of the train into the surrounding swamp. One passenger later said, The train began riding rough, so me and my wife hollered to everybody to get down on the floor. After the wreck, I helped get the people out of my car and walked up front. 
the engine was way off in a swamp, and the second engine was on fire. The truck driver had been killed on impact, but only a few people on the train had to be taken to the hospital for their injuries. The wreck certainly could have been a lot worse, but it was still a massive headache for the company. Practically all of the passengers' vehicles were damaged, with many of them being unsalvageable. Auto Train was insured for these kinds of accidents, but this was little comfort to the 300 people who were now stranded in rural Georgia without their cars. While the collision itself wasn't Auto Train's fault, it was a humbling reminder that no railroad is immune to catastrophe. Despite the challenges, the company was able to recover quickly, and learned some valuable lessons from the experience. Even before Auto Train's launch in 1971, Gene Garfield had planned to expand the concept into other markets. There were proposals for a West Coast version, which would run as far north as Portland or Seattle, and as far south as Los Angeles or San Diego. There was even stronger interest in a service between Chicago and Denver, which would capitalize on the tourist market of winter skiers. But the lowest hanging fruit was closer to home. Studies showed that more Florida tourists actually came from the Midwest than from the Northeast. Using the terminal at Sanford, the company could branch a second route up to the Midwest to capture this lucrative market. In the summer of 1973, Auto Train announced its plans to open a second route to Louisville, Kentucky. The trip would be longer than its East Coast counterpart, running 990 miles over the course of about 22 hours. It would take about a year to launch the new service, but in the meantime, Amtrak didn't take the news well. They argued this would illegally compete with their own Floridian service, which operated on the same route. What's more, Amtrak announced that they were launching an auto ferry service of their own, and this was one of the routes they were interested in using. Now, over the last year, Amtrak had been quietly planning to compete with Autotrain more directly, with a new service called Autotrack. They had originally been aiming for the West Coast, where auto carriers would be attached to the existing Coast Starlight service. But these plans ran into legal problems with the Southern Pacific Railroad, and ultimately went nowhere. With Autotrain's new plans to expand to the Midwest, Amtrak was now dead set on launching Autotrack on the same route. The plan was to attach auto carriers to the Floridian for a good portion of its run, between Indianapolis, Indiana and Point Siena, Florida. Despite this aggressive move, Auto Train's leaders didn't seem threatened by the competition. Gene Garfield told the press, We are far along with the development of our Midwest service. We seriously doubt, however, the Amtrak Passenger Auto Ferry Service could compare with the deluxe passenger comfort-oriented services and facilities offered by the Auto Train Corp. Meanwhile, by the end of 1973, the nation's attention was firmly fixed on a historic gasoline shortage. Americans were suddenly flocking to alternative modes of transportation, and Auto Train was praised as one of the most fuel-efficient ways to travel. The Miami Herald wrote, Looking back at it all now, you would suspect that Eugene Garfield and his associates had a remarkably clear crystal ball. The promoters of Auto Train surely foresaw the energy crisis, for it is fitting in neatly with their grand design for taking cars off the highways and putting them on the rails. As a point of reference, Auto Train saved over 14,000 gallons of fuel on each trip, when compared to all of the vehicles making the drive individually. With numbers that significant, and with public demand higher than ever, Amtrak and Auto Train reached a truce. The oil crisis would generate more than enough business for both of them, and encouraging each other to save fuel was good PR and good politics. In the spring of 1974, Amtrak acquired a fleet of auto carriers for their auto track service. They filled these with rental cars and started performing equipment tests, but this ran into problems immediately. These old freight cars were not designed for the higher speeds of passenger trains, and they vibrated so violently that they damaged the vehicles inside. What's more, the tracks between Indianapolis and Louisville were in such bad condition that they were borderline unusable. With these logistical problems stacking up, the Auto Track project would eventually be shelved indefinitely. Meanwhile, on May 24, 1974, Auto Train finally launched its service to the Midwest. The inaugural run was christened with a bottle of Kentucky bourbon, 
and set off from Louisville for the first of many runs between the Midwest and Florida. Even though the feud with Amtrak was over, Gene Garfield had come out on top yet again. But while expanding the company into a second market was a major achievement, he already had his sights set on more ambitious projects. Just a few months after the launch of the Midwest route, Garfield announced plans to franchise the auto train concept to a group in Mexico. He and the other executives would provide their guidance to get the venture started. But the trains would be owned and operated by a new Mexican corporation, and partially funded by the Mexican government. The route itself would start in Nuevo Laredo, just across the border from Laredo, Texas. Over the course of 620 miles, trains would bring tourists down into central Mexico, ending in Querétaro City. As part of the agreement, Autotrain would receive 3% of the gross revenue, and a 10% commission on each ticket sold. Less than three weeks later, Garfield announced a new parallel business called Truck Train, which would be offered exclusively to long-haul truckers. The idea stemmed from the fact that Autotrain's business model could only really work in high-volume tourist markets. On the other hand, there were far more commercial truck routes across the U.S., and the business was far more consistent year-round. The truck train service would offer truckers the ability to cover long distances without having to drive the whole way themselves. Rather than being behind the wheel all night, they could relax, enjoy a hot meal, and get a good night's rest. While diversifying the company in these ways was certainly exciting, Garfield and his team were losing focus on their core business. The Midwest service had only just started, and there were already rumors that it was underperforming. This wasn't helped when the company cut back the service to just one train a week in early 1975, less than a year after its launch. The Tampa Tribune wrote, The corporation would not officially comment on reasons, but it is believed insufficient ridership is to blame. Sources close to Auto Train said ridership on the northbound Louisville train had been poor, while the southbound train had moderate ridership. The problem was that the company only had one train available to run the route. Given the distance it had to cover, it could only run in each direction on every third day. This awkward schedule attracted fewer riders, and with fewer riders came less revenue, so the company couldn't afford more trains. This put a financial strain on the company, but a glimmer of hope would come from an unlikely source. In March of 1975, Roger Lewis retired from the head position at Amtrak, succeeded by Paul Reistrup as the company's second president. In a stark contrast to Lewis's aggression in prior years, Reistrup was far more friendly to Autotrain. Almost immediately, he began collaborating with Gene Garfield to find new ways to accomplish their business goals together. Under their new partnership, Autotrain's equipment would be attached to the back of Amtrak trains. Their ticketing and onboard services would remain separate, but consolidating their operations in this way would be mutually beneficial. For Autotrain, this would open the door to Amtrak's national network, making it much cheaper to expand into new markets. For Amtrak, this would finally give them the auto ferry service they wanted, and would bring some much-needed revenue to their network. Garfield told the press, We feel it's a great, great day for Autotrain. It's a positive step toward the expansion of our service. I envisioned this kind of service early in the life of Autotrain, and this gives us the opportunity to do so. The two companies would need about a year to sort out the details and launch the joint service. But in the long run, this would stabilize Autotrain's finances and eliminate the issues they were facing in the Midwest. On the evening of March 7th, 1976, a southbound auto train was passing through Quantico, Virginia. Fifteen rail cars suddenly came off the tracks, with six of them plunging into Quantico Creek. Fortunately, all 350 people on board were safe, and only a few sustained minor injuries. But more than 60 vehicles, many of which had been submerged in the creek, were badly damaged or outright destroyed. The cause of the wreck was unclear, but investigators found that, the marks on the tracks indicate that something was dragging for several hundred feet. 
It was suspected that some of the brakes had slipped on and locked up the wheels, but the investigation continued over the following weeks. Less than two months later, on the morning of May 5th, a northbound auto train was passing through Jarrett, Virginia. This time, 24 auto carriers jumped the tracks, and again derailed in catastrophic fashion. There were no injuries among the 560 people on board, but more than 200 vehicles were damaged. Investigators noticed the striking similarities between the two events, and identified the cause to be cracked wheels on the auto carriers. The problem was, the auto trains were unusually long, and their passenger and freight equipment used slightly different braking systems. According to a writer for Trains Magazine, one engineer with whom I talked explained, It's like handling a freight train with fast-acting passenger brakes. Everything must be done slowly and very carefully. This put unusually high wear on the brakes and excessive heat on the wheels, creating hairline fractures and eventually catastrophic failures. A rigorous inspection found 120 more wheel sets that were prone to this same failure. Senior Vice President Richard Goldstein said, Of these 120, many would have met the existing standards of the Association of American Railroads. Our standards exceed those. We're just not taking any chances. If there's any question, we take it off. Between the two derailments, 38 rail cars had been damaged, with seven of them being destroyed. With less equipment to work with, the company suspended the Midwest service for the foreseeable future. They now had to cover the repair costs for the damaged rail cars, the manufacture of hundreds of new wheels, and skyrocketing insurance premiums. If the financial outlook was concerning before, it was now approaching a crisis. Toward the end of the summer in 1976, four months after the back-to-back -back derailments, Auto Train was finally able to share some good news. Service to the Midwest would soon be restored as part of the company's new partnership with Amtrak. For a trial period of six months, some of Auto Train's equipment would ride along on the back of Amtrak's Floridian. If the trial was successful, the service would become permanent, and the two companies would start planning expansions into other parts of the country. Meanwhile, in the spring of 1977, Auto Train signed a five-year contract with Disney, making it the official family railroad of the Magic Kingdom. As part of the agreement, Auto Train would promote Walt Disney World in its advertising. In turn, Disney would host Auto Train reservation desks at the Disney World parks and hotels. This new partnership was similar to the one that Eastern Airlines had thrived on for years. As the official airline of Walt Disney World, Eastern heavily promoted the park, and had captured much of the Florida tourist market as a result. So perhaps it wasn't too surprising just two months later, when Auto Train and Eastern Airlines announced a partnership of their own. Through a special cross-promotion, the airline would give their customers the option to ship their car separately by train. This would capture a slightly different market of tourists who wanted to get down to Florida more quickly by air, but still have their car available after they arrived. While these new corporate partnerships were creating a lot of buzz, the plans with Amtrak were falling apart. After several months of running their joint service, Alan Minnell with Autotrain said, We thought both trains would profit from it. As it turned out, it wasn't financially beneficial to either of us. Perhaps in hindsight, it was a little optimistic to expect two unprofitable trains to suddenly make money when they were attached together. The two companies conceded defeat and Amtrak resumed the Floridian under its original schedule. Shortly after, in September of 1977, Auto Train threw in the towel and pulled out of the Midwest permanently. The Miami Herald wrote, Among the lessons Auto Train has learned is one that other railroads spent decades demonstrating. It's tough for a railroad to make money carrying passengers. Indeed, about a fifth of the company's employees would have to be laid off as a result. Despite this grim news, Gene Garfield told the press, I've always had faith in the concept and the company. I've always thought this could be a $100 million company, and I still do. We've had a pause, we've had problems, but you put them to bed and move on. The one ray of hope in this bleak outlook was the East Coast route, which was still performing as well as ever. The company still had a chance to weather their financial issues, 
as long as they stayed focused on their core business and avoided any further disruptions. In the early morning hours of February 24, 1978, a northbound auto train was passing through Florence, South Carolina. One of the two engines and the front 19 coaches, all carrying passengers, came off the rails. Miraculously, no one was seriously injured, and even the passengers' vehicles were undamaged. Investigators quickly identified the cause of the wreck. This time it was one of the axles on the second locomotive, which had snapped as a result of a manufacturing defect. This wasn't Auto Train's fault, but the flaws in the company's management were starting to become more clear. Garfield and the executive team had never saved up any cash to handle these unexpected events. So while this was far from the worst wreck the company had dealt with, it was enough to nudge them off balance and begin a long and agonizing fall into financial ruin. Auto train shareholders were getting increasingly worried with the worsening situation. If the company was going to survive, it would need some steady new revenue, and fast. The cross-promotion with Eastern Airlines kicked off in January of 1978, and thankfully, it had an enthusiastic response from the public. But while air travel was proving to be a useful ally for Auto Train, it was also on the verge of a historic shift. This year would see the complete deregulation of the American airline industry. For the first time, these airlines could set their own prices and fly whichever routes they wanted. As a result, they were soon fiercely competing against each other with rock-bottom airfares. Many of Autotrain's customers were now finding it cheaper to fly to Florida, and simply rent a car once they arrived. The railroad rushed to drop their prices to be more competitive. But since the rail industry was still heavily regulated, this process would take a few months. By the time the lower rates were approved, Auto Train had missed out on the entire summer tourist season. Things only continued on this downward trend. By the summer of 1979, Auto Train owed customers over half a million dollars in unpaid refunds. By 1980, employee paychecks were starting to bounce. The company was also taking heat from the IRS, which was demanding $2 million in unpaid federal taxes. As Daniel Linhart with the Interstate Commerce Commission said, I don't know what Auto Train's chances of surviving are. Any one of its creditors could drive them into bankruptcy at any time. They could go into involuntary bankruptcy within days or hours. Later that same day, on September 8, 1980, the Auto Train Corporation filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. This would buy them a little more time to keep operating while working out a plan to pay off their debts. The U.S. Bankruptcy Court appointed Murray Drabkin as trustee over the fledgling company. He soon recommended to the court that Gene Garfield and the other executives should be dismissed from their roles. Garfield refused to resign voluntarily, so he was ousted from the company shortly after. In the following months, Drabkin worked tirelessly to untangle the company's finances and get them back on track. He said, there was no way I could have anticipated that this company was in as bad a shape as it was. I have told people that as a practicing attorney, one of the happiest days of my life will be the day when I can turn it over to a group of businessmen with adequate capital who can go from there. But with no new financing available, and with over $24 million of unsettled debt, Auto Train finally agreed to cease operations for good. The trains arrived in Lorton and Sanford for the last time on May 1, 1981. After carrying more than 2 million passengers over the course of nine and a half years, the dream was finally over. Many of the employees had been with the company since the beginning. To them, this was more than just losing a job, it was saying goodbye to a family. On the last day, Garfield was out on the platform hugging and reassuring employees who were just as sad as he was to witness the end of an era. He said, My own feeling is that this day didn't have to happen. These trains did not have to stop running. There shouldn't be a last auto train. Despite the company's poor fortune, the trains had been booked solid right to the very end. The Orlando Sentinel wrote, 
The last two trains carried more than 900 passengers, showing the Autotrain Corp did not go broke because nobody wanted to ride, but because it became a textbook example of what's meant by a hell of a way to run a railroad. With a new gaping hole in Florida's tourist market, multiple investment groups planned their own replacement for Autotrain over the next couple of years. However, none of them wanted to take on the risk of running a passenger service. Instead, they all proposed variations on the same idea, transporting people's cars with what was essentially a freight service. Meanwhile, Amtrak appointed its fourth president, Graham Clater, in 1982. Clater was a big believer in the Autotrain concept, and reached out to Gene Garfield to discuss the possibility of reviving the service. Trains Magazine later wrote, According to Garfield, Clater called him one day and said, Gene, your auto train is going to run again just the way it was. Garfield, an indefatigable self-promoter, later referred to Clater as his best friend. The idea of Amtrak launching a new auto train was in some ways laughable, considering its multiple failed attempts in the past. Clater was faced with a great deal of skepticism, even within his own organization, but he confidently pressed on. The Miami Herald wrote, If Amtrak can reinstitute an auto ferrying and passenger service, and add a profit to boot, then by all means let it do so. It would be good for the railroad's finances, good for Florida's tourism, and a convenience for certain travelers. That's a combination difficult to beat. Amtrak had enough spare coaches for the passengers, but they ended up buying a good portion of Autotrain's original auto carriers. They also purchased the abandoned terminals in Lorton and Sanford and started fixing them up. Last but not least, they purchased the rights to the Autotrain name itself, to help with brand recognition and to honor the company's legacy. Amtrak also made an effort to recapture some of the magic of the original service, with buffet-style meals, multiple domed lounges, and onboard movies. Spokesman John Jacobson said, We're very excited about it. The advantage the Amtrak has over the Autotrain Corp is that we already have the infrastructure in place to absorb another service. We think we can be more cost-effective because of that. Indeed, their business as a whole was not hinging on this one service. If it failed, they could simply cut their losses and keep operating as they were before. Two and a half years after the Autotrain Corporation dropped off its last passengers, Amtrak's auto train picked up its first passengers on the very same platform. The inaugural run departed Lorton on the evening of October 30th, 1983, and arrived safely in Sanford the next morning. Within a month, it was already clear the service was a hit. Amtrak's Vice President William Norton said, I'm happy to report that our results are very, very, very close to our projections. We expect a long and busy season and we have gotten off to a good start. Many of the passengers were fans of the original train, and the general consensus was that Amtrak had done a fine job at picking up the torch. After its first year of operation, the new auto train was made a permanent part of Amtrak's national system. And in the coming years, the service would continue to prove its worth. Not as a passing fad, but as a worthwhile idea that could stand the test of time.